In this lecture, we are going to do the same exercise we did previously, but this time on real data from the S&P. This lecture is going to walk you through a prepared Colab notebook, although a very good exercise, which I always recommend, is once you know how this is done, to try and recreate it yourself with as few references as possible. As always, you can check the lectures, how to code by yourself, and how to practice for a more in-depth discussion. If there's anything in this lecture you didn't understand, or you think I missed a step, or didn't explain why we were doing something, please use the Q&A to inquire. As usual, you can look at the title of the notebook to determine what notebook we are currently looking at. So let's start by downloading our S&P 500 CSV. Next, let's import pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. Next, let's load in our CSV using pd.readcsv. Next, let's remind ourselves what columns this particular data frame has. So we have open, high, low, close, adjusted close, volume, and name. This means that each company's data is stacked on top of one another. Since this is not the ideal format for calculating mean returns and covariances, we'll need to create a new data frame so that we can put each company's data side by side. Now let's recall that even in this smaller data frame, we still have quite a few companies to choose from. Let's call the unique function to see what companies are included. Okay, so this data frame contains a lot of companies. For this analysis, we'll want to keep things simple and only choose a few companies. As an exercise, you might want to pick your own or even try to use them all. For us, we're going to use Goog, SBUX, KSS, and NEM. Firstly, I tried to choose only one tech company to help us with diversification. And for this, I chose Google. We also have Starbucks, which as you know, is a coffee company. We have KSS, which is the stock ticker for Kohl's, which is a department store in the United States. Lastly, we have NEM, which is the stock ticker for Newmont, which is a gold mining company. So as you can see, all these companies are pretty much unrelated. We'll see later whether they had positive returns or negative returns, and whether they are correlated, anti-correlated, or not correlated at all. Okay, so next, I decided that for this analysis, we would be looking at the returns over a six-month period. I think that seems like a reasonable amount of time. Typically, people rebalance their portfolios periodically, for example, every year, every six months, or every three months. So I wanted to check roughly how many trading days there are in half a year. To do that, we can take 252 divided by 2. we find that the answer is 126. So that's how many samples we will be looking for, roughly speaking. Next, we're going to get all the dates that exist in our data frame. The point of this is, we want dates which are trading days that we can select from later. Now, one idea you may have had is to use the pandas date range function that we saw earlier. But as you know, this includes all days, even non-trading days. One thing you can try is, if you recall, there are options to specify which days you want. For example, you might say, give me only business days or give me only weekdays. However, I found that this does not exclude all holidays. So if you try using that, you might find that you will end up with some empty rows. As always, you're encouraged to try that yourself if that's something you wanna know. So in this case, what I'm going to do is take all of the values in our index and call the unique function. As you recall, our data frame currently contains multiple companies, which means the dates will be repeated. This is because we have stock prices for different companies, but on the same days. Next, we call the sort values function, which sorts the dates. Next, we check the length of our all dates array. So it looks like we have about 2000 days of data overall. Next, let's find our start date. Since I've already done this, we know that it's January 2, 2014. Note that it's not January 1, because that's a holiday. Some years, it might even be January 3 or January 4, 
So you always have to check. Next, we do the same thing for the end date. Since we want six months of data, we choose June 30, 2014. Since this date exists in our all dates list, we can use this date as our final day of data. If it didn't, we would have to go down until we found a day that did exist, for example, June 29 or June 28. Okay, so next, we're going to assign the above two dates to variables called start and end. Next, we're going to index all dates, starting from start and going up to end plus one. Recall that the ending index in Python is exclusive, so that's why we add one. All right, so next we're gonna check the type of our dates variable. Okay, and we see that the variable dates is an object of date time index. And we have 124 days in this six month period. All right, so next we're going to build a data frame of close prices where we put the close price for each company side by side. This will make it easy for us to calculate the mean and covariance. So we'll start by creating an empty data frame with the index dates, which are the dates we just found. Next, we enter a loop that goes through all the stocks in our portfolio. Inside the loop, we get all the rows that correspond to the dates that we've selected. Next, we grab all the rows which have the name we are looking for. Next, we create a new temporary data frame to store the close price for this particular stock. The important part of this is that we're giving this temporary data frame a column name corresponding to the current stock. Next, we use the join function to append this data to our closed prices data frame. As you recall, we did this exercise in the financial basics section. Next, we call the head function to ensure that our data frame is formatted as we expect. Okay, and it seems to look all right. Next, let's check whether there are any NA values in our data frame. So there isn't, which means we can move on. Note that if you did choose stocks which had NA values, either you could choose a different period or you could use forward filling and backward filling to replace the missing data. Now, recall that what we want is returns and not prices. So what we're going to do is create a new data frame storing just the returns. Since the returns will always have one less row than the prices, we'll index the dates starting from one. Next, we're going to loop through all the names in our names list. Inside the loop, we're going to calculate the return for the current stock by using the percent change function. Next, we're going to assign the returns to our returns data frame. Note that if indexed the current returns using iloc, starting at the index one. Also note that I've multiplied by 100. This is typical so that the numbers we see are percentages. For example, instead of seeing 0 0.1, you'll see 10, which means 10%. This is pretty typical in these kinds of analyses, so I've adopted that style. Next, we call returns.head to check our new data frame. As you can see, the results are now larger. So if you see one, that means 1%. Next, we want the mean daily return over the period, so we'll call returns.mean. Next, we want the covariance, so we'll call returns.cove. Now, sometimes, for the purposes of indexing, it's more useful to have a NumPy array rather than a data frame we can convert our covariance matrix data frame into a NumPy array by calling to NumPy. Next, we're going to finally get back to our portfolio exercise. As you recall, what we did previously was create a risk return scatter plot 
with random portfolios. So next, we're going to generate some random portfolios. We'll start by setting n to 10,000, the number of portfolios we're going to generate. We set d equal to the length of the mean return series. This is the number of assets. Next, we create empty arrays to store our returns and risks. Next, we enter a loop that goes for n iterations. Inside the loop, we're going to generate a random weight vector. We'll start by creating a variable called rand range. I'm going to set this to 1, but you can use different values if you like and see what effect it has. Next, I'm going to generate a random vector w by taking the uniform distribution, multiplying it by rand range, and subtracting rand range over 2. What does this give us? Well, since rand range is 1, it just gives us values between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. In the next step, I change the last value of w to be 1 minus the sum of the other values. This makes it so that we meet the constraint that w must sum to 1. We also shuffle w, so if there's any particular bias towards the last value, we can at least see it for each asset. Next, we calculate the portfolio return and risk. As you recall, the mean is the mean return vector dotted with w. The risk is the square root of the variance, which is w dotted with sigma dotted with w. Okay, and lastly, we assign these to our arrays of returns and risks. In the next block, we're going to calculate the returns and risks for single asset portfolios. That means, what's my return and what's my risk if I only invest in Google or I only invest in Starbucks? So we start by creating empty arrays called single asset returns and single asset risks. Then we enter a loop that iterates d times. Inside the loop, we grab the return for asset i and the variance for asset i. Note that the variance of asset i is just the covariance at row i, column i. Next, we assign the current return and risk to our single asset returns and risks arrays. Next, we draw a scatter plot of all the returns and risks that we just found. For the random portfolios, we'll set alpha equal to 0.1 so that the dots are transparent. For the single asset portfolios, we will not use transparency and we'll also color these red to distinguish them from the random portfolios. Alright, so what do we see? So again, we see this sort of bullet shape. By the way, this is called the Markowitz bullet. Inside the bullet, we can see all of our individual assets, which are colored red. So there are a few interesting conclusions we can draw from this. This graph shows that, by diversifying our portfolio, we can reduce our risk but receive the same return. For example, take the red dot with the highest return. This has lots of risk, over 2%. However, we can see that it's possible, with the correct setting of the weights, to achieve the same return but with much lower risk. We can see this by looking horizontally on our plot. Alternatively, we can see that, if you don't mind taking on a level of risk as high as the highest single asset, we can still achieve higher return for this given level of risk. We can see this by looking vertically on our plot. Furthermore, we can see that, by taking short positions, we can achieve returns which are higher than the highest return of any single asset. The last thing I want to point out about this graph is, notice the very odd shape. You'll see that, if this were a more perfect curve, it would go a bit higher, whereas this seems to flatten out at the top. This is due to the limits that we've set on our weights. You'll see that, if you change those limits, you will get a different shape for the possible portfolios. One downside to portfolio optimization is that, in order to achieve those portfolios, we would have to take some pretty extreme positions. For example, you might have to short sell or borrow 100% or more of your wealth. This is actually pretty dangerous because, as we'll discuss later, short selling is very risky, and on top of that, it's common to have to pay interest on your short positions. In other words, borrowing money is not free, and furthermore, it can be quite dangerous, just as it is in the real world.